Welcome, everyone. So I'm Madeline Perra, CCL's Program Director, and I'm filling in for Mark Reynolds this month. We do like for him to take a vacation sometimes, you know. Uh, so we're doing something a little different today. After our main speaker, um, we're going to have Marshall Saunders come on, who's our founder, and he's going to deliver the 10-minute talk that he was to have given at our national conference, except that he got a virus and couldn't come. So now that he's all better, I'm delighted to give you that treat of Marshall as well as uh, Drew Jones, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. It's just going to be a great call. So, you know, I love these Saturday conference calls where we all come together. I, the, the last 15 minutes has just been a total blast. And it really reminds me that my group in my town is not working alone to solve the climate problem. Well, I want to give a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. So on behalf of everyone in the organization, we're really glad that you are checking us out, that you're joining us, that you're becoming engaged as a citizen advocate for a stable climate. And uh, you know, I hope that one of the things you'll do if you're new is uh, really soon to check out our members website, CCL Community. We just completely redesigned it to make it as accessible and useful as possible. And just go find the big green new volunteers button at the top and start there. And then I also want to tell uh, folks who are new just a little about us. David Bornstein of the New York Times wrote a column on CCL in May that was titled, Cracking Washington's Gridlock to Save the Planet. It started with these words. One day, ideally in the not too distant future, when Congress finally passes major legislation to curb carbon emissions, Americans will owe a big thank you to the perseverance and discipline of Citizens Climate Lobby. So, you know, it's you, the volunteers of CCL, that David Borenstein is talking about. And here's some of what you've done lately. You made our national conference the biggest and best ever. 1,354 people registered for it. 950 of you lobbied Congress at our lobby day in at least 503 recorded meetings, and a couple hundred more of you would have liked to, but we ran out of space. And as a result of your lobbying, we've added six more members of Congress to the Climate Solutions uh, Caucus, bringing it up to 48 uh, just since the conference, and we anticipate more. So yes, 48 is the new correct number. On Thursday, we got confirmation that Representative Lance of New Jersey joined with Representative Cartwright of Pennsylvania. So good work, everybody. Well, you know, an event like that doesn't happen without a lot of you supporting it back home. Hundreds of volunteers worked on getting an appointment for the lobby day, which, as you know, takes persistence, especially these days. And chapters fundraise to help volunteers go, including their college students in their town. And our group spent a lot of time developing the meeting strategy for their lobby teams. And then you guys collected so many thousands of letters to Congress at events this spring that for the first time we had to arrange a letter swap at the conference just to get those letters to the right people for delivery during the lobby meetings. And then, um, you know, the individual work in the field remains just outstanding. Did you know that one of our liaisons got so connected to his member of Congress that they went on vacation together? <laughs> or that San Antonio reports that their new mayor has signed our carbon fee and dividend endorsement letter. And in fact, we reached our 1,000th signed leader's letter this month. And then uh, when the uh, Senator Baldwin lobby team showed up, the aide there was like, did you guys have a call-in day? We got over 150 calls. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go over the suggested actions later in the call, but please keep going on like you have been, people. It's fantastic. So now let's move on to our, our first speaker. I had the pleasure of hearing Drew Jones give the keynote address at the Citizens Climate Lobby Mid-South Regional Conference in the spring. And right away, I knew that I wanted him, uh, that I wanted all of you to have a chance to hear him. So Andrew Jones is co-founder of Climate Interactive. It's a top-rated climate change think tank that creates the simulations used in United Nations negotiations. He's an expert on international climate and energy issues, and his quotes and interactive data stories appear frequently in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other media. So Drew and his team at Climate Interactive and MIT Sloan, they developed C-ROADS, which is the user-friendly climate simulation in use by thousands of climate analysts around the world, and a second simulator that he's also going to show us today. So Andrew, I uh, hope you're ready and unmuted. Take it away, please, and thank you for being here. All right. 
Well, thank you, Madeline. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk to all of you. I just want to confirm, someone give me a thumbs up. You can actually hear me. We're, we're good to go and you can see my screen. I can right. hear you and see you. Yeah. Okay, great. And you can see my slides that I'm showing. Just yes. To, yeah, great. So um, as Madeline said, I'm here to talk to you and I was here to talk to you earlier, Madeline, because I am here as just a really big fan of Citizen Climate Lobby. And I can say that having been a person who runs a team, we run a team of 11 people who build the simulation models that the UN uses, that the US State Department used to use, and the media uses to determine, are we on track to limit warming to well below two degrees or 1.5 degrees as the goal? We do the math on what it takes, are we on track, and, and so on. And I can say that when people ask me, what are the two things that we need the most? What I usually say is we need a civil society movement to address climate change, and we need a carbon fee and dividend. And so usually they say, well, what do I do? How do I get involved? And I tell them to go call you guys because I am such a big fan of the approach that you're taking, and I basically want to spend the next 19 minutes telling you why and talking about some of the analysis we've done about what's so powerful about the approach that you're taking. And then secondly, the 10 reasons, the 10 reasons that I'm so hopeful that we are gonna make the progress that we really need to make. So that's the main focus of this today. Why what you're doing is so powerful and what are the 10 reasons for hope out in the world? But taking a little step back, um, what we do, and we pull together this team. So this is our team of 11, and I really hope Greg, Frank, and Des Moines I hope you're out there because your son is the guy right under the word interactive, Travis Frank. So uh, Greg's son is one of the people who's developed things that you see here. Um, this is the team that's doing the math. We grow out of MIT, MIT Sloan in the business school where we've built a really fast running model that when the New York Times says we want to report on what's going to happen in Paris, we were the team that Justin Gillis called to say, what is the analysis? And what we found was instead of heading at 4.2 degrees on our business as usual future. If you add up all the pledges to the Paris Agreement and we don't have progress post 2030, and we think we will, but if we don't assume significant progress after 2030, then we're headed at 3.3 degrees, not the 1.5 to two. So two implications of this, we really need carbon prices around the world and we know just to deliver on Paris, the Paris Agreement, but also to get well beyond that down to the green line of 1.5 to 2. So this is the current state of affairs, and I hope you look at this and say, wow, we have some serious important work to do in the future, and a carbon price is gonna be a big part of it. The way that we use that information is, is largely with policymakers and negotiators. So the UN Secretary General, right before uh, the Paris summit, we did a briefing for them, and people like John Kerry have used the simulators. So one area is, get this to decision makers, get it to the media, but also the offer to you all is we've turned this into a game. It's a role-playing model UN exercise that's been played around the world. 35, 30, now 35,000 people have played it. And part of the offer, and Brad Rouse and Steffi Rouse, who are part of the Asheville group, where I live in Asheville, North Carolina, um, Brad, has been uh, encouraging me to remind everybody that this is an exercise where people play the roles of the UN negotiators and get to see what happens if they make decisions to reduce carbon emissions, what happens to temperature in a really vibrant role-playing setup. And what's interesting is that it tends to bring aboard and engage moderates and conservatives. We had, we've done some studies to find out that that's really the case. There are ways, if we allow people to think for themselves and don't get too preachy about what the solutions will look exactly like, but open up the conversation, really like Citizens Climate Lobby has done so well. So really, that's where we come from. Working with the media, working with policymakers, and then making this game. Now, what we're seeing when we run the model, and this is uh, one of our simulation runs, you see the blue line. That is, if we take no action, heading up to about 4.5 degrees. Um, if we, the current NDCs I mentioned head us to about, those are the pledges to Paris, about 3.4 and emissions may flatten. That ratchet success scenario of 1.8, the key thing is, is this is possible. Technically, we can still get there 
to below two degrees. So there will be people, and I run into them all the time, will say, oh, the, it's done. We can't get there. We can't make this happen. And I think that you are a line in the sand at Citizen Climate Lobby saying, no, there are things that we can do. And the model supports you saying, actually, we can limit warming to many of the goals in Paris and to what the scientists are saying is necessary. So hold on to that confidence. The modeling shows it is possible to follow that lower green line if we're able to peak emissions and drop them steadily on the order of four to five percent a year. Um, of course, the U.S. plays a huge role going forward. It's not where the bulk of the emissions are in the long term, but this is an analysis that was published in the Washington Post where we found that 21 percent of the global greenhouse gas reductions come from the United States. So it's really critical to still keep this confidence that the U.S. will be central to reducing emissions, to at least to deliver upon Paris, but then also to get those emissions to peak and actually fall over time. As you know, there are a lot of things that need to happen beyond addressing carbon. And, and you know, many of the policies that Obama had set up, this is one of the diagrams that we designed for the New York Times that explained really the Obama era policies of the state level policies of California, efficiency standards, HFCs, methane, and then the good old clean power plan, and then other actions. And of course, a carbon fee and dividend will, can make up for a lot of these lost uh, rules and laws um, in order to address you know, the, the things that are being lost right now with the, with the Trump administration. So I want to talk a little bit, if we step back, I've told you some of the simulations we've done at the global scale with different countries. But this is the way, and you see the diagram right now, of the broad sweep of what are all the different actions that one might consider in addressing climate change. And you can see it from population and economic growth, forests and carbon price, there you are with carbon fee and dividend in the middle, uh, energy efficiency, other gases, methane, N2O and F gases, what happens with the fuel mix. And now when I travel around the world, people are talking much more even about things like carbon dioxide removal and in a few circles, people will actually bring up things like solar radiation management, putting chemicals into the stratosphere. When we have this conversation and we sit down with people and say, how should we address this important challenge? What I find to be the leverage point when we run our simulations, the most powerful thing that we can do is to put a price on carbon, your carbon fee and dividend proposal. When we run it through the simulators that we've built that look at how it affects energy demand, fuel mix, all the different factors in the system, and eventually calculates temperature, we find it so powerful because it does two big things. The first is the one we think about. We know, well, it's going to encourage zero carbon energy. When we add a carbon price, particularly starting strong, what is the number? Is like at, at 25 or $15, up $10 a year, as you have proposed, ramp it up and up and up and up. What we're finding is it changes the fuel mix, more wind, more solar, less coal, less gas, which is still a fossil fuel, and putting some pressure on oil, but not as successfully as it does on coal. When it does that, of course, it's going to decrease the carbon intensity of the overall economy, which is really important. But the second thing it does in our simulations, and I've been surprised by how well it does this, is it actually spurs energy efficiency and it makes the energy demand fall a little bit more than it would have otherwise. And that's really powerful. I, we find when we model it and other modelers are finding that it curbs energy demand, which also helps carbon, excuse me, helps carbon emissions. So this is a little geeky, but in the math that we think about it, there's population, consumption, energy intensity, that is energy demand and carbon intensity. And all of those things combine to make the carbon emissions that create the greenhouse gases and temperature and impacts. What's beautiful about the carbon price is that it affects both the energy intensity, that is, it leads us to have a more efficient economy and use less energy, and it changes the carbon intensity. It changes how much carbon we burn when we make our electricity and when we fuel our vehicles. So that's one of the things that I find to be so powerful and important about this approach that you're taking that is such a, we call it a high leverage point when we run it through our simulations. So that's one of the key things that we're seeing from our models. 
And I want to pause and just see, just with time, Madeline and Ricky, how am I doing with how much time do I have for my big 10 reasons? Or should we take a question after, before I go into the, the 10 reasons? So Madeline and Ricky, any, any mid, mid, mid? You are, you are uh, 11 minutes in, so you're good for nine minutes. Great, and, great. Uh, and I would say, um, why don't you keep going? Because that is great. absolutely fantastic. Great, great. Yeah. So where are we so far? We can do it. This is eminently doable. And what is the most powerful way to do it? A citizen's movement to support carbon fee and dividend. This is why I'm believing you in it. And this is why I think you all should just leave this room and go work ever more powerfully towards the mission that you already know you're lined up on. Now, the challenge I face, I've been in this field for 20 years now, and I think the biggest challenge that I face is this air of resignation that, is cl that sometimes clouds the conversations around us. And people always ask, oh, what do you do? How do you retain hope? Are you hopeful? Drew, you run these models, are you hopeful? And what I've done through the years is started gathering the evidence because I wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I am going to show up to that Saturday event and I'm going to be part of this call. Why? I have evidence for hope. And I want to share the top 10 reasons when I go around and talk to people about this. Why am I hopeful? So one of the things that's been happening lately, I love the city and state response to all the changes we've seen with the Trump administration. We're finally many, you know, cities and states are responding. There's over 200 of them are signing on saying we're still in. Now, of course, when I, they ask me what to do, there are things they can do, but one of the biggest will be to sign on however they can to what you all are doing to get a carbon fee and dividend. But this should give us great hope. The way that a citizen's movement has awakened, it's taken many different forms, but this is really encouraging to say, to see the ways that cities and states have responded. And we did some math. And we saw that um, over half of the U.S. population is living in a city or state that's aligned with Paris goals. Now, these people, of course, are saying we need state action, we need city action. They should also be doing, jumping aboard of, of the movement that you all are leading. The other one is we know we need to peak emissions globally, and it is happening. If we look possibly, because the last few years we've seen a leveling of global greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a graph since 1980. It's gone up and up and up and up. If you can't see the graph, I'm just going to tell you. It's been, emissions have been climbing since 1980. But the last three years, emissions have been flat. That could be a peaking of emissions that then will start to lead to emissions falling, which is exactly what we need in order to limit warming to no more than two degrees. Number eight, your climate solutions caucus. I love that there is an even number, 24 and 24, Republicans and Democrats, a bipartisan support for climate solutions. So your progress in this area and the possibility of the growth of this movement gives me great hope that we're going to see more and more of this kind of bipartisan, just wise, prudent action to protect the security of the country and the world. It just makes so much sense. So please make this happen more and more. And of course, the evidence of what's happening internationally, because we're just catching up when it comes to carbon fee and dividend, right? Like this is this graph I found that shows 40 national, and you know this much better than I do, but I'm encouraged by the fact that there are 40 national, 24 subnational jurisdictions that have a price on carbon. And people don't really recognize the extent to which other countries are making this happen. And of course, what's happened lately with Baker and George Schultz and Ted Halstead and this recent Republican support for it. This just gives me great hope that we're on, the, on track. The other, so I come out of the systems thinking field. And when I think about what we see in the clean energy economy, I love thinking about the reinforcing feedback loop that a carbon fee and dividend is sparking. What it is driving is a reinforcing loop where we have price of wind and solar coming down, demand going up, and that's kicking off in the industry, more research and development, production experience, economies of scale, public acceptance that draws that cost down even more. So that when carbon fee and dividend shows up and then we have more and more of it, it's easier and easier to make sure we're able to meet 
our energy needs because we have low carbon energy. And this reinforcing virtuous cycle, this beautiful virtuous cycle, this virtuous tipping point that we've passed will drive those prices down. It will drive the diffusion of these low, um, low carbon technologies. The next big one is China. China's production and consumption of coal have at least leveled and fallen le slightly. 2011, they, we had huge growth in the early 2000s, but then 2008, 2009, and then 10, and then it's actually dropped in 14 down to 15. There's a lot more uh, renewable energy, there's more uh, gas that's replacing coal, and of course, in many cities, increasingly a carbon price that's helping drive coal, uh, the transition of China away from coal. So that's reason number six that I'm hopeful. Reason five is that the Paris Agreement provides a powerful framework, even if Trump is successful in pulling out of it. Um, it provides a powerful framework for 194 countries to work together to address this important issue. The fourth reason for hope is what we call multi-solving. And it's the fact that I'm sure you all, many of you have recognized that the things that we do to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels in kind of the effort to address climate change, those things also help us in the near term with co-benefits. The biggest ones, of course, are health. When we have a carbon fee and dividend, when we actually internalize the costs of that coal we're burning and the oil that we're burning, we then have better air quality, we have less respiratory disease, less asthma. It helps us in the near term. And there are many other things with food and water and resilience and helping the energy industry, community connection. There are many other benefits that will help us uh, really appreciate what a wise move it is to keep the coal, oil, and gas in the ground, to internalize those externalities in the cost of carbon, and uh, really reap these benefits from what we call multi-solving. The other one is this principle that we see about long-term social change. Social change looks impossible until it's completed. When you look back in the history here in the United States of how long it took groups like Citizen Climate Lobby to fight for important things, and then one day we're surprised by the sudden growth of an important change in the world. And you just think of like something like uh, interracial marriage. Loving versus Virginia didn't come till 1967. And as of, you know, there was a movement that started in the early, you know, in the mid 1700s with more and more states saying it's okay for have state interracial marriage. There were periods when no states approved uh, those laws. But then quite suddenly in the 1960s, we had this boom. And right before that boom, no one knew it was coming. The same thing with women's suffrage around 1920s. The same thing recently with recreational marijuana is happening and with same-sex marriage that boost, you know, took off years ago, uh, just 10 years ago or five years ago. The point is when we can look around and say, oh, there's hundreds of us involved, because of the nature of social change, it could be that we're right on the cusp of the kind of huge support for the kinds of actions that you're and we're all advocating for that will really surprise us. And I ask you to think what it felt like in apartheid South Africa in the early 1980s, right before that fell apart, or in the 80s before the Berlin Wall came down, or before peace in Northern Ireland, or the civil rights movement in the United States, or the ending of the slave trade in England long before that. What did it feel like five years before that boost? It felt like people showing up on a Saturday, being part of a movement, talking to each other, supporting each other, and then, visualizing that growth and support that might be right around the corner. Social change looks impossible until it's completed. And this movement to support a carbon fee and dividend could be imminent. As Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win. And I think we are right on the edge of winning. I'm also really encouraged by the divestment movement. And that, the way that that conversation on college campuses is helping where young people are questioning whether their universities should be putting money into fossil fuels, I think will prompt this discussion and then will make 
really a lot of the things that, that we're talking about with a carbon fee and dividend look like a, re a reasonable way to address this challenge and respond to what many people are concerned about. And the last one I'll mention is what I saw in Standing Rock. And I think that the way that we had the vulnerable people, diverse Native American groups coming together, arm in arm with other groups saying, we're going to keep this fossil fuel in the ground, really sends a signal to group movements like ours saying that we can pull together with diverse coalitions. I really respect what Citizen Climate Lobby is doing when it comes to reaching across the aisle, you know, Democrats and Republicans. What other movements have done is to reach into people who care about immigration, Black Lives Matter, Native American rights, land rights. There can be ways that we can grow the support for something as wise and economically sound as a carbon fee and dividend by reaching across traditional barriers. Standing Rock is one of the things that really did that, and it builds a lot of hope for me. So those are my 10 reasons, but I'll come back to the start. What I think we need is a civil society movement that looks a lot like the civil rights movement that has us pulling citizen support for a carbon fee and dividend. I think you're on the right track. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Go get them. I've got your back. And please, if there's any way that we can support you with anything that we're doing, let me know how it can happen because we need you to win badly. Send me an email. I put it here on the last slide and Madeline and Ricky can send it to you. But uh, go get them. And I love what you're doing. Oh, Drew, that was so perfect. So much what we needed to hear. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, you will hear from us, I'm sure, and, and in particular from me uh, already, there's a question in the chat about the uh, climate simulation game. I would like to talk with you more about that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and just, again, thank you. You are, of course, totally welcome to stay on for the next 15 minutes uh, for the last part of the call. Great. Um, and we're happy to have you anytime. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well... Moving on. Um, wow, I'm still savoring that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there is more to savor. So Marshall Saunders, um, as uh, most of you know, is our founder, and he's a perpetual source of inspiration for many of us. Now, since he invented this organization and led the very first national conference calls, I know he's not going to mind if I first tell you the actions for the month in Canada and the United States because he's the one who made sure from the beginning that we're here to take informed action and not just inform ourselves. So these are the recommended actions for the coming month. In the United States, one, make plans for district meetings or town halls during the August congressional recess. Two, spread the word about Ted Halstead's carbon dividends TED talk. And three, practice laser talks about the Climate Leadership Council's proposal. And then in Canada, they have two actions recommended, targeting conservative newspapers with letters to the editor and getting ready for their conference coming up in October. Okay, action is good. All right, well, for many of us, Marshall needs no introduction, um, but for those of you who are new, what I want you to know about Marshall is that he is both extraordinary and extremely ordinary. He has extraordinary vision and perspective and commitment, and yet, He's also a regular guy that you can just hang out and talk with. And, you know, Marshall has both inspired me and uh, enabled me to think that I, too, can make big commitments. He's really changed my life. So, Marshall, um, in my mind's eye, you are now coming to the podium in the Regency Room at the Omni Shoreham Hotel, where our conference was, and you're standing in front of 1,300 of us. And just seeing you is enough to have made us rise to our feet and start applauding. And, you know, in, in my mind's eye, you haven't even opened your mouth yet. All you've done is just be you being with us. And so that's how I'm feeling right now. Um, but, of course, we want to hear you, too. So now we're ready to listen. Go ahead, Marshall. Okay. Well, so Madeline, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you okay, just fine great. and see you. You look great. Yeah, great. Well, um, Andrew, thank you. I mean, uh, I, it was a wonderful talk. And it was so good for us and fits what we are doing. Great. And uh, yeah, thank you. There you are. Thank you so very much. 
for everybody else, you can uh, uh, see uh, pictures on my wall. And if you were here and look closely, you'd probably find a picture of yourself. And uh, I love uh, sitting in my uh, office and looking around at and seeing my partners in this great, great uh, movement. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about the early going of Citizens Climate Lobby. Some of you have said you have a little interest in it and uh, some of the difficulties we've, we've faced and, of course, how we uh, originally caught on to uh, carbon fee and dividend. It wasn't for exactly from the beginning. But before I uh, give you that little history of the, uh, of the early going, I want to give you a quote from Alex Steffen. And this quote says for me, who you are, who you are for me. And, and, and Stefan said, optimism, optimism is a political act. Those who benefit from the status quo are perfectly happy with a large population of people who uh, believe that things can never get any better. And he said, these days, Cynicism is obedience. And what's really radical is being willing to look directly at the magnitude and problems of, that we face, difficulty of the problems we face, and still insist that we can solve those problems. So I'm going to read it again. Optimism is a political act. Those who benefit from the status quo are perfectly happy with a large population of people who think things are never going to get any better. In fact, these days, cynicism is obedience. What's really radical is being willing to look right at the magnitude and difficulty of the problems we face and still insist that we can solve those problems. I love your optimism and how you take it into the political arena. And I love your unwillingness to be cynical. And I love your willingness to look right at the magnitude and difficulty of the problems that we face and still insist that we can solve those problems. Well, uh, that's the quote. And uh, now just a little more about CCL's history. And you'll recall from my talk year before, yeah, year before, yeah, last year, that um, uh, I uh, 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 was giving a talk at the uh, Rancho Bernardo uh, retirement home, and uh, 13 people who um, came down to hear me hear what I had to say. And two of, the, uh, two of the listeners, two elderly women, trapped me into saying uh, that I would uh, give the first group start workshop. And that workshop uh, became a Citizens Climate Lobby. And you'll remember that 29 people showed up, much to my surprise, I, I was afraid nobody was going to come, showed up. And at the end of the three-hour session, uh, everybody wanted to take part of it. It was amazing. And uh, we divided into three citizens climate lobby groups, the North County, the Central San Diego, and then uh, and the South, South Bay. And so at the end of the three hour uh, conversation back and forth, everybody, everybody in the room wanted to take part of it. And uh, the trouble was that I hadn't thought about what we might, what legislation we might lobby on. Um, uh, a stable climate, yes, but exactly what legislation uh, hadn't thought that far ahead. However, we soon began to lobby for something called carbon, uh, uh, excuse me, something called feed in tariffs. And uh, it's complicated and the name didn't describe it very well, but we practiced up on our laser talks and for a while we lobbied for that. Then, uh, uh, we lobbied for um, the right of states to regulate tailpipe emissions more stringently than the federal rules. And um, that kept us going for a little while. Then we lobbied the city and county governments to adopt more energy efficient building codes. And again, it was a huge field of which we knew nothing. 
And, uh, but we studied lobby our uh, laser talks and we met, went to meet with the city and county governments. The problem, basic problem with all those proposals was uh, that um, none of them were a match for the problem uh, that we face. Then I called the big green institutions and they were lobbying for something called cap and trade with offsets. And um, we uh, studied up on that, lobbied on that. And the, the moment of truth on cap trade and offsets came to us when we met face to face, the South Bay group, and I, I didn't go on to that meeting, the South Bay group uh, met face to face with representative Bob Fildner. Bob uh, asked the partners, or I think there were six or seven of them there, to explain the cap uh, trade and offsets. Well, they couldn't do it. It was just uh, too complicated. And uh, at the end of the meeting, they said, uh, well, we'll leave you a uh, video of it. It explains it. Well, I, I don't know if you ever looked at it. I kind of doubt it. Um, so that, that was kind of the struggle in the early beginning. And, uh, but in late 2008, uh, we had uh, seven groups. And uh, the problem was our focus, as you can see, wasn't clear. And a couple of our groups, frankly, were a little shaky. And I think it was... Um, Brent Blackwelder, I'm not sure, that suggested that I call Tom Stokes and uh, talk to Tom, Tom about what we were doing. Well, I had no idea who that was, and, uh, but I called him and uh, comes to find out uh, Tom was a 40-year uh, veteran of the climate movement, by now 50 years. And uh, Tom told me that he had organized a congressional briefing in the House Ways and Means Committee Room. And I was, you know, very impressed with that. The briefing uh, was on something called carbon fee and dividend, which I had not heard of. And um, he said that it had already been introduced in the House of uh, Representatives and uh, and uh, he thought that this idea of carbon fee and dividend was be better than anything that we had been lobbying for so far. And I was ready to agree with it. And would I like to come over to Washington for the congressional briefing? And I said, uh, I'll be there. I jumped on a plane and flew over. Well, the House Ways and Means Committee room was full. And uh, I was astonished by that. Um, uh, on this, so we had this very prestigious panel. One of the uh, members of the panel was uh, John Larson from Connecticut, representative from Connecticut, and uh, he was a third ranking Democrat in the House, and he had actually introduced this bill, which they were calling, and I would still call, carbon fee and dividend. Um, there were two very prestigious economists on the uh, panel. And one of them had been Under Secretary of Commerce for Clinton and uh, Bob Shapiro. And I was just very impressed. And then on the far end of the panel, on the left hand end of the panel, was uh, Jim Hansen. Well, Jim was the um, top scientist at uh, NASA. He was the top guy. He had, I don't know, several hundred or hundred and a half uh, scientists working under him. And um, he was my hero at the time. He, I, I hadn't met him, but he was uh, uh, part of the Gore presentation, and I had been using his slides and uh, quotations from him, and there he was right in front of me in person. And so I was uh, uh, very uh, Im impressed. As I sat in the audience listening to these people on the panel, uh, this new idea of, new to me anyway, of carbon fee and dividend uh, made more and more sense. And on the next CCL call, 
which was January the 3rd, 2009. It was our 15th consecutive monthly call. Tom Stokes, who had organized that panel, was our guest speaker. And for the first time ever, Citizens Climate Lobby used the words carbon fee and dividend. And for the first time ever, I felt like that we were lobbying on a solution uh, that was a match for the problem. And then, uh, three months later, Mark Reynolds came aboard to lead us all. And I knew then that we would thrive. Now, uh, back to the quote. What's really radical is being willing to look right at the magnitude and difficulty of the problem that we face and still insist that we can solve that problem. And we are going to solve them. And we are not backing down. We're not going anywhere. We're not going away. We are going to be successful, not with force, but with truth, persistent truth, uh, and uh, with persistent truth and uh, grace and grace. Um, all of na nature, all of God's creatures, all of life are counting on us. So that's about what I had to say. Uh, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being unstoppable. And uh, remember that I love you. <laughs>